Welcome back to another episode of Real Estate Investing Unscripted. I am your co-host, Brendan Bennett, and with me is your other co-host, David Dugan. What's going on, David? Brendan, how are you, man? It's uh, good to be back in studio, ready to get after it again, I think. We had a, a good last episode with our guy Donovan. He dropped some some solid knowledge on us about uh, what he's doing down there in, in the Houston, Texas market and how he's become uh, uber successful as a, a 25-year-old developer. So for those of you that didn't have a chance to, to tune into that one, I'd recommend uh, going and checking that out. What do you think of that one, Brennan? Yeah, I think I think Donovan's a super interesting guy, right? All of his, you know, his engineering background, um, his experience with Fund That Flip. He's a builder himself, so I feel like last week's episode kind of had something for everybody. And Donovan's just very charismatic and and a knowledgeable guy. So great episode, definitely tune in. Kind of a good segue to this week. So we're 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 picking from the Fund That Flip pot again. So we we have another Fund That Flip guest coming on with us shortly. Um, super excited about this one because. While it's also going to be for all audience members, whether you're an investor, whether you're um, a real estate developer, if you're just someone you know passionate about real estate, this episode will have something for you. But I think what I'm really excited about, David, is to really kind of peek behind the curtain of how does a how does a capital work behind a business like Fund That Flip, right? How does how do things move and shake? How do, how does the money get to the developer and back to the investor? So, um, without further ado, I'll have you intro this week's guest. Yeah, so today we have Doug Dvorak. Now, Doug is is the true, I would say, brains behind the whole operation here, right? Like we got all our our territory managers out in the field. They're they're the guys that everybody sees, right? They're the handsome faces out there. Doug's the guy behind the scenes making everything move and, and tick. So uh, excited to get his perspective. He is our VP of Capital Markets here at FTF. His background includes 13 years in the mortgage and lending industry, four years as a uh, uh, a broker, and he's a real estate investor himself. He's done some private money lending. He's in the process of uh, earning his master's degree in urban planning and development. Doug, welcome to the show. Happy to have you on, man. Yeah, thanks, guys. Happy to be here. Appreciate it. So, Doug, if, if you will, for uh, those listening, uh, David gave a, a quick background, but if you could just give us like your 30, 60 second, who are you, what do you do, and and what brought you to fund that flip? Yeah, absolutely. Currently the VP of Capital Markets here. They have fun that flip, as you guys know, and also simultaneously building out our long-term rental product as well. So it's been a great six months here with the team thus far, helping to build a market leader here in my hometown that I'm so passionate about in Cleveland. Um, my wife and I are parents to two young kids that keep us busy here. And like you'd said, Dave, I'd, I'd spent the previous 12 years um, working throughout the mortgage industry, was out in Chicago until about two years ago after attending Loyola University. And Ran right into the housing crisis after after college. Managed our uh, property preservation department and post post default department for fifty billion dollar residential mortgage servicer in the aftermath of the, the housing crisis and transitioned over to origination in 2013, 2014, um, including most recently a few years as an independent mortgage broker. And I've originated over a billion dollars to cross that threshold uh, in the past well last six months of my time as an originator over a billion dollars wow. and residential mortgages during my time. But yeah, now here with Fund That Flip, leading the capital markets team, an incredibly unique role due to the diversity of our capital, as you guys know. So it's been great. So Doug, let's let's unpack that a little bit. The the VP of capital markets, right? Big title. What does it mean? Tell us tell our listeners what what that job actually entails. Yeah. Yeah, trying to live up to that title. It's uh capital markets, you know, Fund That Flip, it's it's managing the end buyers, the end investors of the loans that that we originate, right? So we utilize certain short-term capital, you know, that that's then replenished when we sell whole loans or or raise money through our platform, replenishing that short-term money so we can lend it back out again. Um, so, you know, what we're trying to do is offer our developers a singular access point to the variety of capital that we work with, from hedge funds to insurance companies to REITs to individual accredited investors through our platform, and ultimately allow our sales guys like you to run and, and finance the projects that we believe in, the developers we trust, in the markets that we have confidence in, and you know, providing these developers with the lowest cost of capital, the best leverage points possible in the industry. So, you know, while many other originators and our competitors are limited to one or two singular points of capital, institutions ultimately that, you know, limit what they can originate, we have a pretty incredibly diverse capital stack that includes multiple institutional partners, securitization, our retail platform, uh, where it's individual accredited investors from all walks of life can 
land or invest as little as a thousand dollars into a project. Yeah. So to kind of just, uh, oh, maybe an oversimplification, but you know, David and I are kind of focused on the the developer, the guy finding the project, the guy or gal finding the project, bringing it to fund that flip. And you're more focused on the different spaces that we pull that money from to then deploy it. You're focused on that as your sole customer, right? And how you're how we service them, um, how we present them new opportunities in the space. Is that is that a fair kind of summation? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a, it's a balancing right of what you guys do, and obviously that's why we have have the meetings that we do. But it's uh, it, it, there's also a little bit of, of a salesmanship to it as well, you know, in terms of um, making sure that they understand the projects that we're lending in and why we we believe in them. But also coming back to you all and and, and keeping the reins tight there too. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, I think it'd be really good to dig into the different stacks of capital that we have at Fund That Flip, but also just in like the greater marketplace, right? So obviously this is a Fund That Flip hosted podcast, but I also think that kind of speaking about it in the market at large will be good for the listeners. So I'll start macro, Doug, and then I'll probably zoom in to, to Fund That Flip. So like a typical lender that does what we do in our space, where do they get their capital from? Is it the same as ours? Is it different? Start there just kind of on a macro level. Yeah, sure. Most uh, other originators, you know, they will securitize. They'll have, you know, perhaps one aggregator that that's, that finds end buyers for them. Others will go through, um, you know, one end buyer ultimately that that they trust to to uh, to provide the capital that they need. But obviously, it's a limiting factor there. So, you know, where we set ourselves apart, while we do offer both of those options as well, we we have the the, the, the crowd, right? So, not many options out there where the originator is also the uh, crowd funding provider. Um, so the deals that we post up there are deals that we are obviously and projects that we are obviously originating and uh, underwriting ourselves and servicing through the process as well. Got it. So so other lenders they'll they'll do a mix of you know securitizations. If you know they're a larger, more established firm, they'll do institutionally raised capital similar to how we do. And then I think there's a couple originators out there that also do a crowdfunding model. I, I don't know if many people do all of them at the same time. So if, if you want to our three different capital stacks just give like a high level into each of those and that'd be really good. Yeah, sure. So institutionally, you know, we have multiple uh, end buyers uh, from hedge funds and, and insurance companies and, and um, family offices and other other capital that that they agree that they collect and deploy into this asset class, right? So that's one option there. The other, like we've said before, and, and something that you know we're we're doing more and more of is our own securitization, and then the third being the crowd, right? So accredited investors who you know, have to meet those SEC regulations to be considered accredited, can come in and, and lend in as little as $1,000 into a particular project. Um, so th- those are the three different capital stacks, era, you know, access points that we offer. Okay, very cool. My question is, if I'm a borrower, if I'm someone who's looking to come to fund that flip for capital, why do I care? Why do I care that you get institutional money, you get accredited investor money, you have all these different avenues of funding? Like, why does that matter to me and the borrower? Yeah, it's a fair question. It's a resiliency, right? So, you know, from a borrower's perspective, diversity of capital allows us to offer more competitive pricing, more unique leverage points, uh, you know, a more expanded buy box that's not limited by the ebbs and flows and feelings of, of one particular partner, including the the geos that we originate in as well, right? So they're, they're markets that we believe in, right? They're typically close to the top 300 MSAs in the country here, right? So um, we feel strongly about those markets and we don't want to be controlled by somebody who may differ. Uh, but it ultimately allows us to offer that broad offering to a multitude of, of developers via, you know, one point of contact for that developer, right? One one consolidated point of service for each project. Um, you know, we're, we are that access point and developers really shouldn't ultimately feel who invests on the back end. So it's a huge benefit that we provide is, is one point of access to, to basically all types of capital that exist. The Real Estate Investing Unscripted Podcast is brought to you by Flipper Force. Tired of using spreadsheets to manage your projects? Looking for a system to consistently track your deals? Flipperforce is an all-in-one platform that helps real estate investors successfully run their businesses. Whether you're working on rehabs, new construction, or rentals, Flipperforce has the tools you need to analyze deals, estimate rehab costs, create project schedules, and track project expenses easily and on the go. Sign up for a free trial at flipperforce.com today. That's flipperforce.com. Uh, on the flip side of that, Doug, I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective on the institutional side. So there's billions of dollars that are being put to work from those institutional partners. Why choose 
this space, right? Why, why choose the, you know, residential investment property asset class for those, uh, those people on, on, you know, the fund managers or whoever's uh, putting, putting those endowments forward? Yeah, 30 to $50 billion, you know, in, in the space here nationwide, right? So the return and risk profile simply just, it makes sense. And they're, they're filling a housing shortage void in, in many of the largest MSAs nationwide. And, you know, we've talked about this at length, but, you know, household formation continues to outpace new home construction, and it has been that way for, for quite some time. So, you know, for the institutions we partner with, we feel strongly that we have a broad range of channels that allows us to re- remain a consistent provider in the space and attract the best clients, right? So, uh, therefore, we're attracting the best projects. Uh, we've been told as much by our partners. You know, they don't want to be the only option that we have. They feel that that limits us and our reputation and our offerings to our developers, and and, and ultimately would would bring a less quality developer to them. So, um, you know, many originators simply have one channel or even one end buyer it limits their depth of their relationships with those developers, who in turn demand the best originator, which we would consider ourselves to be. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to also point out. The loans that we do originate are mainly, you know, sent to each channel, including the institutional partners and, you know, the, the many that we have there, um, as well as our crowd, um, you know, in a round robin type style, right? So it's almost like a vertical slice of the loans that we originate. Institutions typically take time reviewing one loan tape or a collection of loans on, you know, you know, packaged together at one time before deciding to purchase and they do their own underwrite, right? So sometimes that can take a few days, you know, a week. Uh, we don't want to be slowed by this, right? So we move to the next partner and then move to the next channel. You know, we keep our offerings uniform and, and across, you know, the uh, the variety of projects that we believe in, right? So it's in our best interest as a company to, to give equal opportunity into the loans we originate to all investors. You know, and obviously if we were to adversely select, that would show up on the scoreboard and be pretty short-sighted of us. So, you know, we're incentivized to originate good loans, but um, also offer each channel an equal split of those loans based on the types of loans that they believe in, and, and we're geared towards you know thinking long term in this regard. Doug, thinking about the accredited investor channel, so like the, these people are high net worth, uh, high income earning individuals. They have options, right? Like they could, you know, I know with in light of FTX and everything else in the crypto world, it's not the most attractive thing right now. But like, there's crypto, there's you know the stock market, there's all these other things. What what makes someone invest? Uh, whether they're one of our accredited investors or just like a private lender on the street, you know, lending out to their local developer, why would they do that? Like with with that money? Yeah, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, honestly, personally, being a, a private investor myself, it's a, it's a hands on way to uh, see the before and after effects of of your money being put to work. Right? It's not a passive. It, it's passive, but it's a little bit more active than than just giving your money to a financial advisor and, and seeing where it ends up. Right? So. Uh, but ultimately, you know, most investors are, are simply looking to diversify, right? So, so many individuals in this country and everywhere, I would say, but are overexposed to the stock market, you know, and to the equities market. And, you know, we're confident that the access we provide to this asset class is, is unique and is a wise decision for these investors to explore. Um, you know, experts suggest a 70-30 split between equities and, and fixed income. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're offering a first lien against a tangible property with developers we believe in, with limited leverage exposure and at high rates of return. And so it's found incredibly attractive. Um, you know, obviously many of our investors have already invested in this asset class and, you know, back channel private lending, golf course type investments to people that, that they that they know within their personal networks. Um, this of course has its limitations and its headaches and um, they may not have experience underwriting projects if they do any underwriting initially at all. They may have trouble navigating the lien recording process or, or release of that lien at the end of the process there. Um, they may have issues collecting payments or may not collect any payments at all until things are, are you know, complete, if and, if and when they're complete. And, um, you know, we're slowly issuing draws on prog- projects as they progress. We're verifying that progression. Um, you know, we are navigating any type of delinquency issues that, that we may face or maturity issues that we may face and and making sure projects are continuing and we still believe in them as they extended a little bit longer than than we may have initially expected. Um, so they're, you know, investors are able to trust us to develop the relationships with these borrowers, underwrite the project and the developer's creditworthiness and, and service the project through its term, payment collection and remittance back to them, obviously inspections and draws, um, maturity extensions if if needed and, and payoffs and then the following lien re- uh, release process there too. So we offer this one point of service we have the boots on the ground, you know, as you guys help lead with strong sales relationships. You know, we have our account management team that has their eyes on each project through the life of the loan and life of the project. And 
and a dedicated uh, collections and asset management team experience in, in the space committed to maximizing principal recovery, which we can boast about a 99% recovery rate, above 99% recovery rate there. So it's an incredibly valuable service that we're offering here, right? So um, accredited investors, we also have insurance companies and family offices that utilize our platform. You know, we've been through rigorous due diligence and auditing by large experience institutions that have been in the space for years that we're, we're currently partnered with, right? So, you know, if we just had the crowd, you wouldn't have this reassurance. Sure. Um, Right. But they, they've given us the green light on the way we land, the way we service, the performance of our projects. You know, all of this due diligence has been done and, and should give confidence to investors that, you know, this should be the platform and the way for them to get actively, passively invested in, into the asset class, into this space. Doug, that's incredible stuff. And I don't want to stay down this path just a little bit longer, right? Because it, you touched on a couple of things. One, from the institutional side, you said they like the projects that, that we offer them, right? And, and it sounds like the, retail side of accredited investors and, and family offices and insurance companies that invest through our platform. They like the projects as well. And you touched on a few of those reasons. If you could, what makes a really attractive product? Like why, why the projects that we offer them from an asset perspective? Quite a bit, right? So one, the, the credit worthiness of the customer, the, the vetting that we do, right? The experience levels that we, op, that we require. And, and you both can probably talk on this a lot more than, than I can in, the, in that regard, as far as what you're seeing when you're on the ground and walking through the projects that these these developers have done previously, right? You're, you know a good developer from from a tier two or tier three type of developer, right? So you're able to to come in with that confidence and guns a blazing and ready to show off the customer to our underwriting team, where you know credit levels are, are set high and and leverage points are, are set reasonably, right? And the customer actually is coming in to the project with their own skin in the game, and and you know. Uh, their own belief in the project, obviously, to complete it within the timeline that, that we set. Um, the inspection process, right? So we're, we have our construction risk analyst team analyzing all of that. The the underwriting team, I, I know I skipped the over them originally, but they are doing a thorough vetting and pushing back on you all when maybe something isn't as, as great as it seems and as shiny as it seemed initially um, and getting it to the right place and, and, and making sure that you know the deals are fully vetted and, and uh, the appraisal looks good and the values are verified and um, all of that as well. So um, there's a lot to like, but yeah, the rate of return at the end of the day, you know, 11% plus, 12% plus, you know, um, it, it just makes sense, right? So it's a relative difference from the safe, quote unquote, safe money that they are able to borrow to then deploy over here. And, and they, they continue to do it because it simply pays off, right? So um, it just makes sense. And it's, it's good to be a trusted partner for all of these investors. Yeah, I, I, you know, from my perspective, right, which has always been on the front end of the business, it's been about putting as thorough of a file together as we can for our underwriting team and so that that file can make its way to, you know, the finance side of our business, our business and ultimately into, into your hands, right, or your team's hands to market that to our investor base, right? And, and the more thorough of a file, I've got to imagine, the more attractive that loan is when you have all of those data points, like, you know, potentially an appraisal, right, and a, a good credit score, right, and a, a high net worth individual, and, and the project pencils out really well, right, and you start to stack all those up, um, what what would be deemed normally as the kind of high risk money, right, the, the hard money, that's, that's high risk. We've, we've almost kind of de-risked that. I, that's my perspective on it. You can correct me if I'm wrong. It's, no, you're 100 percent right. The only other things I would add is it's it's a first lien against a tag, tangible asset, right? And um, it, 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 we, you know, feasibility studies on construction budgets. You know, there's a lot more that goes into it behind the scenes that that get us comfortable. Profitability, right? We'll turn a customer away if it just doesn't make sense on a pro, from a profit perspective. So there's a lot more that we do to get comfortable with the deal first. And I think you know, a unique stance we have is that. We, ha we are more involved in the performance of these deals than I think other originators are, right? So we want to build a sustainable business, right? We, we don't want uh, to burn bridges with the investors that, that are investing through our platform, right? So um, I think we have a, a little bit more skin in the game. Um, and, and so we, you know, take it a step further and, and don't just wash our hands after the loan has been sold. And, and you know, we're in it for the long haul with these, with these customers as well. I, you know, I, what stood out to me in terms of joining fund that flip was just the relationships that we have with the developers. Right. And, and I think that's truly where we set ourselves apart on the front end. Um, and, and that's, that's not something we want to lose. Love it. So Doug, if, if we can kind of, in light of today's environment, we've David, you and I have talked about this on nearly every podcast at this point, just cause it's hard to ignore 
the the rate hikes in 2022, right? So we went from yep. you know two to three percent conventional mortgage rates. We're now approaching you know six, seven, seven and a half percent mortgage rates. All this money kind of comes from the same place. It's all it's not directly tied to whatever the 30 year conventional mortgage rate or the 10 year treasury yield is, but it's it's pretty close. They're definitely correlated. Um, maybe not just you know unilaterally. How has that changed? the capital market space over the last nine months or so what have you seen the accredited investors the institutional investors you know the different channels we get our money what are what are they saying and what what, what are their actions how how's it differ yeah i mean on the front end just quickly you know and you guys could could speak obviously to this a little bit more of course but borrowers are being more judicious right and and, and profitability has to really make sense now in the current environment which we're helping to evaluate for these for these for these developers but you know, for our industry, you know, obviously, with borrowers being more judicious, that means less projects for us to compete for, right? But we feel well positioned there because of the diversity and the resiliency of the capital that we offer, right? So, for these investors, they need to see the relative spread between safe money and our asset class for it to make sense for them, right? And they're getting it. We're offering eleven percent plus, twelve percent plus rates of return for six to twelve months month notes, and uh, obviously, that's a pretty big climb from where we were six months ago. Um, pretty dramatic cr- climb from where it's been six months ago, but this is short term. You know, these are short term notes, and so the level of service that we provide, the closing speed that we provide, still attracts the best cu- customers. And as you said, Brendan, like the money's coming from the same place, and so it's it's not necessarily unique to us to offer these rates. It's simply that relative difference between safe money and and what our asset class, and and make sure that risk return profile makes sense. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty everywhere, right? So. You, you touched on crypto. Uh, don't not want to necessarily get into all of that, but even equities, right? So it, it, there, there's a consolidation. You know, I think markets aren't necessarily the money's not necessarily as widespread in the market as it as it was before. And so this asset class continues to be incredibly attractive, and it, it's outpacing obviously the high rates of return that we're seeing as housing typically does. So love it. So Doug, we've talked about all these different opportunities for investment, accredited, institutional. Uh, the retail institutional outlets. So if if I'm an accredited investor, because obviously that's probably the bulk of the people listening right now. So um, people who have earned over 200 grand for two years in a row, or that have a net worth over 1 million, if they want to get started in our space, and whether it's with Fund That Flip, with another hard money lender that has a similar structure, like what's the first step that they would take to be able to deploy their capital into this space? Yeah, fundflip.com, the tab at the top, invest. It'll take you to our page. You don't have to be logged in to see what we have available there too. So if you're just interested, you know, log in, give us a call, email us, ir at fundnetflip.com. You can email me directly, Doug, D-O-U-G, dot Dvorak. It's like the composer for all you musical folks, <laughs> D-V-O-R-A-K at fundnetflip.com. And I'd be happy to share more information there. But once you're uh, logged in, you'll, you'll verify your accreditation. And it's also, if you're a... a uh, yeah, financial advisor and hold hold licensing uh, in that regard. You, you can also invest through the platform without the net worth or or income you know criteria being met. But yeah, once once you're verified as accredited, you can begin investing. And one thing I do want to to touch on here, Brendan, is the uh, the series note funds that we do have available through the site. So you know we we offer obviously the individual projects that you can invest as little as five thousand dollars into. There's also diversified funds that are termed series notes. There's a pre funding note fund. This is basically our warehouse line of credit, right? So it's it's invested money um, that is solely used for origination. That again, as I mentioned before, is replenished when we sell the loan on the back end. So just wanted to touch on that. It's also used for construction draws. That again is replenished when we get reimbursed from our investors or increase the, the amount of investment into that particular deal as it's progressed and become more attractive and closer to payoff there. And then there's a residential bridge note fund currently that diversifies your money across all of our bridge notes, right? And, and, and so it's it's a small amount of dollars into individual deals uh, across the spectrum of, of region and, and property type. And so I uh, just want to touch on those very quickly because those are yeah, incredibly attractive projects as well. Obviously, with that diversification, less rate of return. Um, so just to be cognizant of that, the the, uh, the bridge notes, right, those those individual projects, will you'll, you will see higher rates of return on those. Um, but yeah, so once you log in, invest uh, the invest tab will show you all of those deals and verify your accreditation. You can begin investing right away, and you know link up a bank account with deposit interest directly into your account as it as it's received on a monthly basis. And yeah, an email to me, a phone call to me, you know, reach out to us. Let us let us educate you or, or share more information, and uh, I'll hopefully I'll have some some good conversations coming from this. One last question about that. Uh, sure. 
uh, the the principal investment from our investors. How long should they expect that to be in these deals before they receive their principal back on average? Yeah, anywhere from from six months to 12 months is the, is the original term, right? But as we're issuing draws, we may need to raise more money. And so there will be deals up there that mature in two months, in three months, that, that may be 100% complete, um, you know? And, and so there, there's a lot of options there. So we're talking short term, right? We we may, you may see the occasional 18 month, but you know, you'll see a commensurate rate with that. And so nothing longer. 10 to 12% returns, diversification, improving communities. We got, we got it all here at Fund That Flip with Doug. Got it all. Doug, thanks for joining us today and, and giving us the breakdown and the peek behind the curtain of all that is capital markets. Um, I think it's, again, really good for everyone to see the back end of the business. We talk a lot about the front end of the business on this podcast and just about real estate in general. Um, so really appreciate you, you joining with us and you can go ahead and take us out. Yeah. Real quick, Doug, uh, you mentioned your email address. Where else can people find you if they want to find you? I'm not active on social media. You can find me on LinkedIn if you'd like, but we, we got to get you in that, the Twitter I'm, sphere or Instagram I'm or something. Posting the occasional, the occasional baby pick. Yeah. on Instagram, but yeah, it's, it's a personal account there, but otherwise, yeah, find me on, on LinkedIn and, and email me doug.dvorak at fundthatflip.com. I'll reply back there and we can, we can schedule a conversation. Awesome. Doug, thank you again for your time. Incredibly insightful. Uh, Love having you on. I will uh, sign us off here. So for Brendan and Doug, I am David Dugan. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Unscripted. You can find us at fundthatflip.com or on all the, uh, the social media platforms across Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, etc. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, guys. This podcast is brought to you by your friends at Fund That Flip and produced by Converso. Fund That Flip is here for real estate investors all over the U.S. We are the premier hard money lender connecting active investors to passive ones through crowdfunded loans in order to make real estate investing accessible to everyone. We believe providing transparency into our process as well as research and resources for investors at every stage, we can open up the world of REI to more people and help small businesses everywhere transform their communities and make an impact on their neighborhoods. Learn more at fundthatflip.com. Make sure to rate us and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and find us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube.